Hello, everyone, and welcome from wherever you are joining us. Today's webinar is part of our Nitty Gritty Business Winning Practices series, Score Higher Through Readability and Customer Focus. There's obviously a lot of interest in this topic based on the response. I am Mallory Price, and I will be monitoring in the background for this session. Thank you again for taking time and investing this hour with us and our industry leaders. Also, thank you for the questions many of you submitted when you registered. We also pulsed many of our contacts who evaluate and score proposals and infused their input into this webinar. If you have questions as we go, you can submit them in the control panel in the questions tab. Time permitting, we'll get to those during or at the end of the webinar. Slides and the video replay will be posted on our website by tomorrow as well. As a reminder for APMP members, this webinar applies toward your continuing education units for certification. Our panelists today include Paige Frame. She is president of McKinnon Mulherin, an industry leading business communication firm. Paige brings over 15 years of writing and communication consulting experience. On her LinkedIn profile, you'll read, I connect brilliant communicators with skilled experts to deliver content that explains, encourages, and excites. Kelson Forsgren is Vice President of Program Development at Shipley. For over 20 years, he has worked as a proposal leader, practitioner, and master writer. He currently directs a team of over 40 full-time professionals who provide worldwide support, ranging from content curation to writing graphics, and to writing, to graphics, and desktop publishing. Brad Douglas is Executive Vice President of Shipley's Global Services. Brad will also moderate today's webinar and provide insights we've gained from proposal evaluators and practitioners in the industry. So once again, thank you all for joining us and thank you to our panelists for providing your expertise. So today, this is what we'll be talking about. How are proposals really scored? What do evaluation scores and readability mean for that score? And we'll talk about the relationships, trust, and credibility, and how they matter to that um, evaluation score. We'll talk about customer focus, the four Cs, making it easy, and the tools and templates that can help you in all of this. And then we'll get to some question and answers. So Brad, I will hand the rest of the, the time over to you. Okay, uh, Mallory, thank you. And, and please, Mallory, um, interrupt us. Jump in if there's questions that are relevant to where we're uh, at in the, the uh, webinar and the topics, and let's address those as we go. So we thought we'd start with a little poll and let you uh, just give your, uh, your two bits worth. And again, thanks for joining. What are some of the speed bumps that proposal evaluators tell us and tell you <laughs> That, that cause them some grief when they're evaluating our response. So let me pull this poll open and let's have you um, just cast your vote. There's no real right or wrong answer here, but take a look at this and let's uh, see what you come up with. Okay, should be showing the results. They showing up there, Mallory? Yes, they are. Okay, so pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, <laughs> uh, feelings about what evaluators uh, don't like when they're re reading a response or evaluating a proposal. Hard to find the answers, of course, uh, and in trying to interpret what we as as proposal writers or contributors have said, and then you see small percentages uh, for the rest. So thanks for that input, and you're you're exactly right. You know, those are the major, major speed bumps 
that uh, that evaluators have told us they run into over and over and over again, but yet they keep running into those speed bumps over and over and over again. So hopefully some of what we talk about here uh, today in this webinar will help resolve that and make it easier for them uh, to evaluate and find the right information and they won't have to go hunt for it or they won't have to guess and try to interpret what we've said. So how are proposals really scored? Uh, I'm, I'm going to issue everybody a little assignment, a little challenge. Think about your own organization or think about you personally. How do you select what you're going to acquire or purchase? How do you go about it? What's your rationale, especially major purpose, uh, purchases? I, I invite you and challenge you to talk to uh, associates, friends, uh, teaming partners, other businesses, uh, your own purchasing um, group, and ask them, how do we at our company, for example, how do we select a 401k plan? What process do we go through? What do we really score? How do we score it? How do we rank the, the uh, submittals that we've received? How do we choose a benefits plan? Uh, and, and just think to yourself how this happens in reality in your own organizations or with other businesses you know. Because you'll come to realize, as we all should, that there's formal regulated methods that proposals are evaluated, and then there's more informal methods and approaches to evaluating bids and proposals. And we just all have to remember, before we get into you know, the actual readability and how to elevate our scores, we need to keep in the back of our mind always that we are proposing to humans. It, it, these are generally human beings. These aren't automated scoring systems that calculate how often a key word appears in a proposal. That might be part of it, but it is human beings that are evaluating our responses. So you can see here, notice this first over on the left, 50 to 60% of the time, a buyer, a customer might be into the decision-making process before we are even engaged or know about it in many cases. You know, customers have a ton of data at their fingertips. They're way better informed now than ever before. Think of all the information a customer or a buyer has at their fingertips now that they didn't have, say, five years ago, including all the AI information and data that's out there. So we have to adapt. We have to think about how can we best reach the decision makers, those that are they're going to evaluate our proposals, our submittals, and give us the higher score. And if we don't, if we just keep responding the same way we've always done, uh, we're, we're losing ground you know, and we will likely lose more opportunities than we gain. So we've got to remember the human element. And uh, some of you have, have, I'm sure, taken some of the Shipley training before, and you've probably seen something like this, but there are many scoring systems out there, whether we're talking uh, government contracting, business to business, or business to international, nonprofit. Uh, some evaluators are going to use a numerical numerical system. Others are going to use adjectives, outstanding, good, marginal. Some are going to color code. Others are going to force rank our submittals. We should understand what our customer's evaluation process is as we go through the business development capture process. Now, I'm going to ask Kelson, this is a sad reality, but and I think we all know this in the back of our mind, but we hate to think about it. Kelson, will you <laughs> explain this idea of what we mean by evaluation column fodder? What exactly is this warning all about? Sure. Yeah, the challenges that we uh, face in the competitive marketplace is that we're not the only ones bidding on opportunities, whether it be in a uh, in a government workspace or even a commercial workspace. Um, well, we're typically going to be competing against others. Sometimes what we don't recognize or realize, especially if we don't have good relationships with 
the uh, the potential customer is that uh, the customer has already made a lot of uh, evaluations and decisions along the way about who they are wanting to have bid. There's the open bid format, which is required by uh, procurement law, uh, sometimes like that with the federal acquisition regulations. And so, uh, you know, it is required that there, that agencies go out for bid. Uh, even commercially though, there's uh, options that uh, companies will look at to see if how other companies may, may uh, line up and compare to their, their preferred bidder. And that's sometimes a situation that we'll find ourselves in. If we're not aware of the process that the customer has uh, gone through prior to actually issue, issuing a uh, request for proposal or request for some kind of submission, then we may find ourselves to be in a problem area. Uh, if you have the requirements here on the left and they're selected or they're chosen or they're desired, a uh, company that they want to work with is the one, the one that closely aligns with what they have in column A. Columns B, C, D, and E may be, you know, some crazy version. And this is actually a lot of what happens with when people see something on uh, SAM.gov or some something that is posted and hits the street and we didn't know about it and we say oh we fit with that and we try to go bid on it it's a, uh, and, and sometimes we're surprised that we don't win it because hey we thought that matched really well with us well we're probably in the cde range uh, because we have no connection with the customer prior to this being issued so it it, it really matters to be able to to understand um, the customer, what they need, what they're asking for, have some communication and direction, contact with them, that we're able to understand how well we align with what they're looking at doing and the requirements. And at least if we can't get into slot A, then at least be a, a, a credible uh, competitor at slot B and get uh, being able to get to slot A in the future. But this this is true, this type of a reality is true for almost everything that's being bid out there. Uh, Excellent. Just because we submit doesn't mean we get it. Thank you. So uh, we need to ask ourselves along the way, you know, are we just column fodder? Are we just filling up a column by putting forth a submittal? Or have we really done our homework and shaped the opportunity um, like column A, you know, bidder A has? They've aligned themselves nicely to what the requirements, the expectations are. So I'm gonna go through this really quite quickly and you can come back to this. Uh, Mallory suggested this will all be posted so you can come back to it, of course. But there's formal regulated evaluation methods. So we talked about there's formal and informal. I'm gonna walk through and it's gonna be uh, kind of quick. Um, some of the formal regulated evaluation methods just so we understand how then we can try to elevate our scores and be more uh, uh, accessible and, and viable for the evaluation committee. So there's, there's methods that vary by country. They vary if we're bidding into any kind of government space, uh, agency, local policies. Many of these are well-defined uh, with well-defined rules and regulations. Uh, there's this confusion sometimes between when we're bidding on, on work, being compliant versus being compelling. You know, are we just answering the mail and just answering the, the request or are we really trying to be persuasive and elevate our evaluation scores that way? So let's walk through these. So <laughs> there's only a few, you know, if we're bidding in the federal government space, there's only a few uh, uh, agencies and groups that have a twist on their the federal acquisition regulation, but you can see how weird this gets. I mean, there are so many rules and regulations and things that are different in each one of these. So just be aware, this is not one size fits all when it comes to evaluation. Yes, the in in a federal and U.S. federal environment, they are all regulated by the federal acquisition regulation. However, each agency and group has their own nuances. This is an example, this is a, a pretty big deal, right? But this is an example of what a, a, an evaluation team might look like. 
So for the, those of you that might be new into trying to enter and crack into the the government markets on 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 a lot of procurements and acquisitions, this is the type of evaluation team. You know, you've got a source selection authority at the, t at the top, and it trickles down clear into where you've got these factor evaluators that are looking at very specific factors in the solicitation and then everything in between. Uh, so this is how complex it can be. Now, if we're bidding business to business or this is a small quick turn agency or group or a university or a, uh, some kind of local government that we know, it, of course it's not gonna be this complicated and complex. So we need to understand the, the method. Uh, really quick, so this is an example of, remember I mentioned some are going to color code and some are going to use adjectives in their ranking and scoring. This may be news to some of you, but the Department of Defense, for example, this is how they're going to rank uh, the technical risk on what we submit to them. Are we going to be outstanding, good, acceptable, marginal, unacceptable? They're going to put us in one of these categories and color code it. The, the overall technical rating, kind of similar, you see here. They've got a color ranking, they've got a a adjectives to describe it. The technical risk, again, is it low, moderate, high, unacceptable? An evaluator has to put us into one of these categories. You know, they, they, can't, they can't create their own category. This is the type of evaluation method that's going on. Now, uh, Kelson, I'd ask you to maybe just take a few minutes on how we're being evaluated when it comes to past performance. Sure. It's interesting in proposals, and we probably all see this all the time, that if, so, if a customer asks for a certain requirement to be met, anybody can say, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, we can do that. But that's not all that's required. Uh, what we need to be able to do is not only show a viable solution as part of what we submit, but we also need to show, and it's typically required, uh, to have some aspect of perform past performance. I want to make sure there's a distinction between having experience in something and having performance in something. You may have experience from different team members and companies that may be teaming partners, but if it's not related to the specific components that are required as part of this deliverable, then it's going to be rated lower. So you can see the, the different ratings here, uh, very relevant down to not relevant, and showing that you've got to meet uh, scope, magnitude of effort, level of effort, and complexities, and show some, uh, some value in having achieved those things. All those types of things go into past performance, whether something that you have done in the past is relevant to what the uh, the uh, reviewer and what the agency or the company may be looking for. And then on this slide, it shows they also look at specific confidence in your ability to perform based on what you submitted for past performance. Uh, and, and if you were able to make the connection between scope between um, magnitude of effort and the complexities, the challenges that you face and how you resolve them. Those are the types of things that give uh, increased confidence in your ability to perform on this upcoming contract. So these things are, are good things to be able to look at because just because you've done something once or one person on your team has done something kind of related, you need to know that that's not the uh, only thing that the the uh, customer is going to be looking at or the, and evaluating on. There is actually a structure. So be aware of and familiar with. And if you're not able to meet some of these things, it, either you choose not to bid or you find a, a teaming partner that can uh, have that uh, level of confidence in their work. Thank you so much. And, and I want to refer uh, one of the many questions we got for those of you that registered and submitted questions. Um, you you asked about how can we simulate an evaluation um, from the customer and this is a, the exact kind of information you need to be aware of you need to know how 
you're likely to be scored and evaluated. For example, Kelson just talked about past performance, both at the um, relevancy level and at the confidence level. And then the previous slides showed the technical, technical risk, uh, technical performance. Uh, so that's the answer to that question is by understanding how we're going to be scored, then we can simulate the customer as we're working through our proposal and we're going through maybe some reviews with our team and someone or a few people can actually simulate being the customer and doing the evaluation. Or, you know, hey, if we only scored seven in this one area, what can we do to strengthen that and get that to a nine or 10? If we're kind of in the neutral confidence here level, what can we provide in our past performance to prove that really we belong in the substantial confidence category? Thank you, Kelson, for that. And then the other area really that, that we're gonna be judged on, uh, especially in a, in a government contracting space, is just we're going to be deemed, you know, our, our solutions, our responses strength as a strength, it has merit or exceeds specified performance or capability requirements. Something may be deemed in our response a weakness, which means a flaw. It's increasing risk to the customer or a significant weakness, which we want to avoid that at all costs. And again, we simulate this as we go through our proposal development or solution development. Are we going to be dinged as a significant weakness or a weakness in some of these areas? So be, be aware of that. And here you see her asking, have you met or exceeded my expectations? Hopefully we, we get into that exceed category. And just kind of to summarize the, the value, you know, we're, we're, most of the time our customers are looking for best value in who they select, what solution they choose. And really it, it falls into these categories mainly. Are we proving to our customer that we're improving their mission and, and solving their issues? Uh, are we improving efficiency, reducing costs, quality, reduce risk? These are some of the, the buckets, if you will, the categories that we need to be thinking about. So how do we improve our scores? How do we improve readability, which we're gonna talk about now? We think like the customer, we think like the evaluator. Um, so that's, that's an overview of some of the more formal, regulated evaluation approaches and methods that are being used. So let's talk just briefly about then, what about you know business to business and we're not so regulated as we would be in, in say a government setting. So informal, less regulated uh, methods, again, similar though, we've got to know the customer. What are their key decision drivers? Relationships do matter and we've got to avoid relaxing and being lazy because we're the incumbent and thinking that of course we're going to win because we've been executing on this contract for five years. And so Paige, would you take a minute and walk us through just some of the evaluation methods and approaches you've seen in, on, in a more in, informal bidding environment? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, there's just a lot of different ways that non-government proposals can be evaluated. So while on the government side, it may feel um, overwhelming the way that things are being scored, a lot of times we do know how they're being scored and we have a little bit more um, information in that way. And on the other side, when it's more informal scoring, we need to know the customer better. We need to know if they are um, making deals with people outside of the formal um, proposal process, if they're figuring things out on the back of a napkin, and or if they're reaching out to their network, asking friends and family, and um, getting information more than just what is put into the proposal. Um, some evaluators may be looking at it specifically from a um, numbers 
perspective rather than uh, the narrative or story that you're telling. Some might be more like a government proposal that they have their own ranking system, whether it matches that exactly or is their own version of how they're going to um, rank things. Depending on the size of the organization, um, maybe it's one person, one single stakeholder who is making that decision. Um, they may also be comparing all their, their different bidders or even relying on some consultants or committees to make that decision. So across all of these, the key is really to figure out what is most important to your customer so that you can um, not only touch on that in your narrative, but really think about it from an evaluation perspective on um, if you're going to make it easy for them to pick you and uh, really highlighting those things that are most important to them because the more we know about them, the better our win probability. And this comes back to what Kelson went over in the um, government pers uh, section is this still happens on the, the commercial non-government -gover side as well, that um, maybe they have made that handshake deal and uh, need to just reach out to a few others for um, either just because they're curious or because they're required by their board or whatever the reason may be. But um, if we have the sense or if we know for sure that we're column fodder, it might be best to just no bid early on um, and not waste the time and resources on putting together a uh, fruitless proposal. Awesome, that's good. And I'm sure we could, if we were all in a room together, um, we could share horror stories about times when we, we believe, we thought we were in a good position, we thought we had a really good solution and proposal, only to find out that um, the our potential customer is going to award this contract or this work to someone they worked with before at their last company. You know that that uh, it, was, it was predetermined, but they they put it out to bid, and we ended up in B, C, D, or E. Unfortunately, so we need to to try to know where we're at. Try to be in that column A position where we can influence the outcome, the evaluation. So what really does influence evaluation scores? So the, these are a couple of points here. Proof, evidence. It's really hard if, if, we're in a, if we're the customer, it's really hard to turn our back on a solution and a solution provider that is demonstrating really strong proof and validating what they can do. Relationships, of course, we all know how important those are, and then readability, which will be the focus of, of most of the, the webinar going forward. But uh, Kelson, could you just re-emphasize for us, not just past performance, but the concept of making sure we validate and provide proof? Certainly. Yeah, the um, evidence and, and proof, those types of things are, are very important. In the, and they manifest in these types of things that are listed here. Uh, how well did you do the service, not just being able to do the service? Uh, were you able to stay within budget? Or if you're working with the customer uh, about other activities that may expand the budget, was that coordinated beforehand? Um, really putting the customer in the, in the driver's seat on all of this in uh, making sure that, that we're communicating well with them we're uh, making sure that we're delivering quality. Uh, the timeliness aspect, or, or if we're on a specific uh, timeline, did we meet that timeline? Uh, those types of things uh, matter, and they show as uh, evidence or proof that we can actually follow through and deliver a quality product. And then you have those uh, ongoing relationships in both in the uh, execution of the work and then also working with the customer to help them understand what they could do next or how they could improve things going forward. So the, right. it's, it's important to be able to um, have these types of things uh, in your minds as you're doing delivery. Uh, sometimes with larger companies, we have something that's uh, thrown over the wall with the, the people that sell the project, thrown over to the people that, that actually implement the project and there's some 
conflict there. We want to make sure those things are seamless on our side so they can be seamless when we work with the customer. So a couple of things here about uh, relationships that are important for us to understand. Uh, we've already talked about how in, in the evaluators are human. They have uh, feelings and experiences before that kind of uh, help them shape their evaluation process. We have the opportunity to uh, position ourselves and our company and our solutions with them as we listen to them and their needs prior to them uh, soliciting uh, actual solutions by proposal. Uh, as we build a relationship with the, with the customer, do they trust us? Do they trust what we say? Are we only trying to push our solution for them onto them, or are we truly helping them understand uh, what they may need to do to achieve what they want to achieve. Sometimes even uh, it's valuable for us to say, you know, we're not a good fit for you, but I'd recommend going in this direction. That type of information is valuable in establishing and creating trust. Uh, the kinds of questions that we ask in our relationship are important. The questions based on what they need, not on, hey, can you use this that we that we provide? And then being able to listen to what they say. If we don't have an agenda going in other than to find out what they need and help them identify those things, that will help them better in preparing the request that comes out. It will help us better in responding. And as we are uh, engaged with our customers, it's important to be aware of uh, their time, um, the activities that they're participating in, and make sure we give them. Uh, the credit and attention due. So a couple of those quotes that are there, uh, you'll notice that they're, you know, the Warren Buffett one is rather pithy, but it's it's true. And you've seen that uh, happen in the media uh, over years and even in possibly in personal relationships. But as we make the effort to uh, develop the racial relationship properly, so it's a, it's a benefit to the customer, not just a benefit to us, but a benefit to the customer. They will notice that, they will acknowledge that, and they will respect that. Great, and then uh, thank you, Kelson. And um, in reviewing the questions that were submitted uh, at registration, you know, actually a few questions were about uh, this idea of, of building relationships um, and trust and what impact that really has on um, a, an evaluation and I venture to say it's becoming more and more important and not less um, even in the government contracting space um, we have to be visible we have to be present we have to be credible um, in in our, our our website content and, and information and messaging in our social media our customers are checking us out and so this this sounds like a soft part of the evaluation process you know because it's not quantifiable it's not a score sheet it's not on anyone's checklist but we are seeing this more and more in all markets that these relationships and this concept of building trust and credibility really really do matter okay um Mallory, I'm going to pause before we, we move ahead into the readability uh, and really focus in on that, the readability of our proposals. We've talked about the evaluation methods and approaches. Are there any questions that, that have been submitted or prior submitted that you think we ought to address at this point? Um, I mean, there are some that we could. Um, I'm sure we may even answer some of these, but Paige, um, you know, we talked about um, you know, some of this readability thing. But one question did come in that I am interested in your response to. How do you deal with proposal writers who think their writing is perfect and does not need improving? Or that it does <laughs> need improving? <laughs> what do you do in that situation? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and we will talk a little bit more about it. But I think it's um, maybe it's important for all of us to recognize that none of us are perfect readers or perfect writers or readers, <laughs> uh, but that we all need an editor and someone to review our writing um, 
that it's it's never a case that our first draft is uh, is going to be perfect. So um, honestly, going back to what we were just talking about with evaluators and the client building a relationship, building relationships within your team, among your writers and editors, making sure that you all have that same singular goal um, so that uh, we're not attacking someone and telling them that they're not a, a perfect writer, but supporting them in um, turning that first draft into something that's even greater with some, some review loops. Good. Anything else, Mallory, that we ought to address at this point? Um, I think we're going to get to a few of these. So I might save some questions until after we go through some of this. Great. Okay. Um, and one question that kind of leads into this, uh, and I'll read it exactly. It says, uh, what is readability? Uh, readability in the eyes of the customer. Can you elaborate on how to incorporate this into a proposal? So that actually leads into exactly what we want to discuss here uh, for the rest of the webinar is what is readability? I will summarize it. Readability really boils down to those two uh, main answers you responded to in that poll right as we started the webinar. Are we making it easy for the evaluator to find information? So ease, making it easy. And are we making it understandable? Are we making it clear to them or are we overwhelming them with technical gobbledygook? So those two uh, ideas, uh, ease of access to information and response and understanding constitute readability as we're defining it in this context. So let's uh, let's talk about this a little bit, and and maybe to start off, I just wanted to show this is just a, a simple. You you you've probably seen something just like this. This is from a request for proposal that came out, and notice the words that the customer is telling us is is using when they're telling us what's our responsibility as bidders as proposers to them. Look at the kind of words they're using. And I know many of you see this all the time, you know, so, but they're not kidding. They want unambiguous, convincing proposal. They want it, the material, the information to be logic. I didn't make this up. This is straight off an RFP. Logical, unambiguous. It must be clear and convincingly demonstrate that they can do what they say they do. That's that proof Kelson talked about. Demonstrate accurate understanding of what we, the customer, want and make it viable. Kelson talked about the difference between past performance and past experience. Make sure what we're, we're proposing is viable and, and then prove it. So these are all the types of words that are appearing in, in our government's request to us. And we need to address all aspects. That means we have to be completely 100% compliant. So yes, we want to be persuasive, want to be clear, viable, logical, unambiguous in all aspects of the solicitation. If we miss a few and we don't respond, likely we're going to be tossed out. OK. That's reality. That's the reality of what our customers expect. And in a less regulated, less formal environment, even though they might not tell us that, they might not say, hey, uh, in your statement of work or your, your proposal that you send, they won't necessarily use this formal of language, but I'm telling you, that's what they're thinking. They don't want to wade through 20 pages of stuff when you could do it in three. Okay. So uh, as far as elevating our evaluation scores through readability, uh, some of you who have joined us for prior webinars uh, or training will be familiar with these seven pillars of effective proposals that we often talk about and share. And it is in line with being laser focused on the customer and trying to get the best score possible. We're talking about being compliant 
responsive. In other words, addressing their underlying needs, having a competitive focus. Why are we better than competing bidders? What is our win strategy? Are we focused on our strengths? Have we mitigated our weaknesses? The quality of our writing, and here's what we're talking about now when we talk about readability and elevating our, our, our message, visuals, our graphics, our, our, our visualization, and then page and document design, and we'll talk some about that. But these are the seven pillars we ought to be always thinking about to advance our readability and hopefully elevate our scores. So uh, Paige, I'm gonna ask you to um, talk a little bit first about, uh, there were several questions about artificial intelligence and chat GPT and other, other uh, platforms and technologies. We'll talk a little bit about that and then talk a little bit about some of the tools that most of us have right at our fingertips that we may or may not even be leveraging. So let's uh, turn this over to you for a little bit and um, uh, have you talk talk us through this. Yeah, definitely. And I I think it uh, is reflective of the the wider world right now, too, is that we're getting a lot of questions about how should we use AI? How can we? Um, should we be uh, leveraging large language models to generate our content? And, um, and it's an exciting time. They can do a lot of powerful things and are uh, generally getting better and smarter, uh, but we also want to be very cautious of how we're using them. So on the pro side, uh, it's very uh, exciting, like I said, to, that it's quick, easy, broad access to content. It's so fast to um, suddenly get information and, and have it generate content for you. Um, I love using it to brainstorm ideas. And so, um, especially if you've got writer's block on something, you can go into a um, large language model and say, what are five benefits to having an experienced team? And it might just come up with things that you had not thought about. Um, you're not using them word for word, but you're just getting some ideas that you can then put your own um, information into that of knowing your customer and which of those five things they would actually like or not. So um, using it as an early on tool to brainstorm can be extremely useful. You can have some quick first drafts. It, it's definitely fast. Um, we'll get to the, the caution part of that, but um, certainly can uh, create things very quickly for you. And you can also use this to research the customer and competitor. So in some ways it's um, it's like a Google search that's gonna pull 10 different websites or more like a thousand different websites to answer your question. So um, asking about your customer or if you know who your competitors are and, and what they might be, um, what's important to them, what they talk about a lot, um, it's taking that all those multi sources and pulling it together for um, an answer for you. But that one is exactly um, the first caution to have from there is that if they are pulling in from lots of different areas, um, one, it might be wrong. We don't know which websites it's pulling from. And if you put information into it, you don't know where that information is then going uh, to other ones. They're, they're always learning and always building into their, um, into their large language model more information. So uh, always avoid putting in any confidential information that could somehow get over to your competitors or just into the general public. Um, that's a major caution. Since it's grabbing from so many different areas, um, it could be biased. It uh, could be lacking contextual knowledge, but there's also the element of being able to put in some of that context into the inputs, which makes it really um, interesting. But because it is so fast and, um, and a machine, uh, it can turn into some loss of accountability and mistakes. Uh, it's it's so easy that we're losing some of that element of really putting together this response ourselves. Um, overall can conflict with 
what the truth is, what reality is. Uh, we just really, more so than with any other writing, need to make sure that what we're putting in there is still accurate um, and true and, and not just trusting what is pulling out of um, a large language model. Well stated, thank you, Paige. And then um, here are some some tools that some of us may take for granted or not really leverage. And and I know Paige, you're, you're expert on most of this. Would you uh, would you share this? So along with AI as being a source for content and and uh, maybe improving readability because it can give us broader broader access to content. Talk about some of these tools and how they impact readability as well. Absolutely. Yeah, these tools are built right into Microsoft Word and truly are AI. That it, it's a way that the machine is reading our content and giving us suggestions. And um, boy, has it gotten better in the last 10 years that <laughs> we had spell check that would um, just look for spelling, had no sense of context. And then it started to learn the sense of context. And if you're using the right word, within the sentence. Um, and now, instead of just spell check, uh, Word has the editor tool. And it is extremely useful. Um, it can go through and you'll see even the refinements are grouped into some of the same things that we're recommending of clarity and conciseness. And whether it's too formal, that can uh, reduce readability if it's too formal. So uh, really leveraging this tool, as you are writing your proposal in Word, um, go through and, and see what suggestions it has. Um, the caution here is that sometimes it is wrong. And so you want to make sure that you do um, not just accept all, you want to think through it. And if you're not sure if it's right or not, having an editor who can um, come and, and fix those things for you too. But um, overall, it's it's extremely useful. And on top of the editor tool, uh, Word has a built-in readability score. And you don't want to use that as the um, final say on whether your proposal is readable or not. Um, but it can help you out to figure out um, kind of what grade level your writing currently is at. And if you want to try to bring that down by having some um, more concise sentences, things like that, um, it is another tool available just right there in Word for you. Paige, I'm, this is unfair to, to ask you off the cuff here, but is there kind of a readability level standard that you would suggest in, say, business proposals? Are we talking 10th grade? Um, any research yeah. or thoughts you have in mind? It's a That's a great question. So we've had some um, documents, not necessarily proposals, but uh, generally they say that the, the average public, you should bring it down all the way to a fifth grade reading level wow. to um, to get the widest group. Um, I think that is pretty low, especially for proposal writing. Part of the formula is how long your words are. And so if you are writing a proposal to um, a specific organization and they have a, a lot of um, long words as part of just the the solution and you know the evaluators are going to understand those long words they're part of the um, industry you definitely don't want to be working to bring it down to a, a fifth grade uh, reading level but if you do pull it up and and you get a really high readability score um, it just might be something to look at to to kind of try to adjust things and, and bring it down a little bit Interesting. Great. You you answered a couple of questions there that were submitted in advance. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, Paige, if you'll continue a little bit, um, we've tried to consolidate this into improving readability and then leading to higher evaluation scores in these four four categories, if you will. Clear, concise, yeah. correct, and compelling. So I'm going to just turn your, this over to you a little bit and Absolutely. Yeah, I think this sign right here is uh, is the punchline that we want to make it easy on the evaluator and taking a look at these four things, making sure that our writing is 
clear, correct, concise, and compelling um, will help make it easy for your evaluator. And a major part of that is um, collaboration. And so I know there was a question on um, specific tips on improving readability responses written by multiple people. And um, I think a major uh, tool for that is having a style sheet that everyone has access to. Um, and you can make sure that everyone is um, aligned on, on these different things of what's clear and correct. Um, that's going to make it more, uh, increase your readability and also keep that um, tone and style throughout, which is very important. Um, and so the first one, being clear, you want to make sure that you are answering the question. So we don't want the evaluator guessing at what you're trying to say. Um, be clear and direct about it. So here's a, uh, a little quick activity of, um, here's our sentence here. I utilized a multi-tined metal tool to process a starch resource. What do you think they are trying to say here? I think you can type it into the chat and maybe Mallory, can you read a few? I sure can. What is this writer trying to say? Um, I eat spaghetti. I smashed <laughs> potatoes. I used a fork to eat rice. Ah, oh, there you go. I okay. used a fork to eat a potato. Yeah, lots of different ideas. That's right. Yeah. So, and one of our one of our participants got exactly right. I used a fork to eat a potato, but honestly, all of those responses could have been true. And so, um, one, we want to know what our um, customer is looking for if they want us to be talking about a potato or spaghetti. Um, but also, then we need to be really clear back to them on exactly what we are going to do, um, not confuse them with. Um, jargon or even just overcomplicating things. And in the same way, we want to be concise in both um, from all the way down to word choice, up to sentences, to paragraphs. Um, sometimes we're required to do this with page limits, um, but also it's just something we can do on our own, um, that we should be doing on our own to make things easier to read and understand. Uh, I've noticed from personal experience that the large language models, so if they're generating content for you, um, can be quite wordy. And we end up having to do even more significant um, editing and rewriting. But the AI tools such as Word's editor tool uh, can help with this a lot. It often will um, pull this up for uh, for me, for our, for content that we're getting from clients, um, it'll identify when you are being wordy and when you can tighten it up. So uh, that is a, a great resource to use and um, can also help you start to recognize it in your own writing as you're going along. And then to also uh, be correct. So um, obviously very important to make sure that what we're saying is true and that we're, um, we've got the right facts and figures in there that um, are solid proof, um, but also being correct in our grammar and our word choices. Um, this is where the word editor can be a good first pass. And then it's also really important to have um, a second pair of eyes, an editor, um, and then proofreader come in and also make sure uh, that we're being correct. I know Mallory said the question um, about perfect writers, and then I think there was another question about whether editors are the enemy or not. And I, I think that this is a really good place to say that uh, editors can, be your friend and they can be very helpful in making sure that what you're writing is correct, that um, we all make mistakes when we're writing uh, and a really great editor can fix those grammar mistakes as well as checking um, those facts and figures against uh, resources to make sure that those are correct as well. Awesome, great. And then that last category really of being more readable is uh, be compelling. You know, what does compelling mean? It means, you know, being persuasive. Um, maybe there is gonna be a keyword 
search done? And if so, we, we've got to use the customer language as much as possible so they understand it, they can find it. Uh, tell us and show us. That's what's being compelling. Don't just tell us you're going to solve something or provide something. Show us how that's going to benefit us. And then those of you that are familiar with Shipley and our methodology and approach, uh, we really believe that the way we organize our proposal and our sections really, really is important. We've got to follow the instructions. We've got to put the most compelling benefits-oriented information up front, our strengths and what we bring, our differentiators, discriminators. Uh, themes and subject lines are really important. Their guideposts uh, use headings. Uh, we overlook this too often. Headings, uh, think how you read, how you look at a web page or an article. Uh, chances are you glance at the headings first. And then group similar ideas. You know, we, we don't want to have our information scattered all about so that the evaluator has to search for it. That was one of those key points in the poll earlier that, that you all picked up on. Don't make the evaluators search for information. So in that context, I'm going to ask you now to don't put your pens down. I don't want you to write anything, but I would like you to, I'm going to show you some letters, give you a few seconds to look at those, and then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and keyboard those in, type those in to the question section on the control panel of the webinar. So take a look at these words. Don't write them down. Don't, don't take a picture of them. Just try to remember them. Now, try and put those back into the questions of the control panel, of the webinar control panel. Mallory, you can read a few off as they come through. Well, we have some people who said they give up, and we have others with possibly a photographic memory. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's obviously complicated. Okay. All right. So um, these are those same letters. So what does this have to do with readability? Group our similar ideas and information together so that the evaluator can find it easy in one place. So these are the exact same letters I showed on the previous slide, just grouped. Had I shown it this way, you probably all would have remembered it and been able to uh, parrot it back. It's, it's the same, it's the way our brains think. It's the way evaluators think, they're human. And this comes from this little book, Made to Stick. But isn't that what we're trying to do in our proposals? When we're trying to compete for work and win work, we're trying to present ideas, concepts, solutions that bring value, that, that will help the evaluator remember us and give us the highest possible score. And grouping our information using organizational best practices is, is one way to do that. Okay, so always be customer focused. In the interest of time, we're gonna just show this, and I was gonna have Kelson walk through this, but we're gonna respect your time and just show, here are 10 ideas, proven ideas, of ways to score higher by the way we communicate our message. We mention the customer first. We focus on the benefits. We leverage our strengths. We forget to leverage our strengths sometimes in our, our briefings, our proposals, our communication. And this will be all on, on the website, on the replay, so you can come back and take a look at this. We also have two handouts for you. Um, and so if you go to the handouts, maybe you've already seen that, there are two documents there that you can download. One is those seven pillars that we talked about of effective winning proposals. And the other one is the, uh, the, uh, something like this, kind of a checklist, if you will, of how to be evaluator focused. So those are there to download. We'll, we'll keep the webinar on live to give you time to download those if you haven't already. So again, thank you so much for joining Paige and Kelson. 
uh, thank you so much for your insight, sharing your experience. Uh, we, we talked about how important it is first to understand the evaluation process and approach. Know our customer, what matters to them, and try to simulate um, what their needs are and the, their highest priorities. Avoid being column fodder in the evaluation process. We don't want to be in column B, C, D, or E. We want to be in column A. And we do that by the way we write and interact with the customer. Leverage existing tools and technology. Thank you, Paige, for enlightening us there. And then focusing on these seven pillars and always, always, always stay customer or evaluator focused. So um, Mallory, is there any, we probably have time only really for maybe one question if there's one more lingering. Uh, we've addressed a few as we went, so thank you. Anything we ought to maybe quickly address? Um, I think there is one. Um, and Kelson, I think I'm gonna pose this to you. How do you increase readability when, RF, when the RFP doesn't allow graphics, visuals, or tables? Great question, and then we'll probably see that happening more and more often as we are submitting to uh, platform types of uh, products that our customers are asking us to do. Some of the things that we have already talked about here today, though, will still apply. Uh, being clear, being concise, being correct, being compelling. Uh, when we are only uh, allowed to use words, those are still things that we can do. We can still also be customer focused. Uh, if we're limited to words, those are still things that we can do to help improve, again, the quality of our response, be succinct, and uh, be able to meet the needs of the, of the customer. So yeah, some of our visual things may go away, but we still can with our words uh, be uh, really uh, effective in communicating to the evaluator. Great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day and week this week. Uh, we invite you to join us on future webinars. We really uh, depend on a lot of you <laughs> to uh, give us some feedback, topics you'd like to uh, have us address, some of the questions that are out there that you have. We really try to focus on, on key information that can help us win. We're all trying to compete for work and win business. And uh, Paige, Kelson, Mallory, thank you so much. And everybody, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.